I'm Harold Ahn, co-founder of Whitehall Rowing and Sail and designer of the Whitehall Spirit Solo 14. The Solo 14 is a slide seat rowboat incorporating a Whitehall style hull. Today I've got Adam Creek, four-time world champion, winner of six gold medals and lately winner of another gold in the 2008 Olympic event in the men's rowing eight. Adam is also a rowing instructor for several years and is about to show us the finer points of rowing a slide seat rowboat. Before we go into the details, I'm going to introduce some of the equipment we use in the boat. So you can see the boat is equipped with an outrigger. It has, a, has an oar lock right here that swivels and the oar lock that comes standard with the Whitehall boat has about a four degree pitch. If you're wanting to adjust the pitch, you can buy a or lock from another manufacturer like Concept2 and it's easily fittable on these on the pins here. You can also see we have a sliding seat. The seat moves back and forth so that you can use the biggest muscle groups in your body. That's your, that's your legs. You can also see here this is where your feet go and when you're moving the boat along and you're putting power onto the blades the biggest force on the boat comes on the footstops here. And of course we've got the oars. You can see right here we have a carbon fiber oar. The, it's made of carbon fiber because it's light and strong just like an F1 racing car. You can also see there's a hatchet blade. Some blades are Macons and uh, have even spacing on either, either side of the, of the shaft, but a hatchet has a has a has a larger area below the shaft to give you a bit more mechanical advantage. These became popular about 15 or 20 years ago when materials engineering moved to the point where you could actually make stronger blades. As we look closer at the blade, you can see that there's a uh, a different shaped part as you move up the circular shaft. This is called the collar. If you look closely at the collar, you can see that there's a very flat part and this is very integral when you're feathering and squaring the blade. You can also see that there are two other semi-flat parts and a rounded side to the collar. <clears throat> to put the blade in the oar lock, you're going to use the smaller end of the shaft. You're going to insert the small end into the oar lock, like so. When you're sitting in a rowboat, you're going backwards. So starboard will be on your left and port will be on your right. As you can see, starboard, the standard color for starboard is green. There are two positions that a, a blade goes in. One is on the square and one is on the feather. When the blade is on the square, that's the way the blade looks when you're taking a stroke. When a blade is on the feather, that's the way the blade looks when your blade is out of the water, when you're on the recovery. When your blade is on the square, the flat part of the oar presses up against the pin. When your blade is on the feather, the flat part of the oar rests on the base of the oar lock. Because you have these flat parts, it makes it very easy to, uh, to tell just by feel whether or not your blade is completely squared or completely feathered. If, you're, if you try to put your blade in the water and it's half squared or half feathered, the blade is going to dig and you're going to catch what we commonly refer to as a crab. You want to make sure that the collar on the starboard oar, which is green, you want to make sure that the collar is pushed firmly up against the oar lock at all times during the rowing stroke. This again ensures that you don't catch any unwanted crabs in the boat. <clears throat> when you're putting your blade into the oar lock, you need to pay special attention to which direction the oar lock faces. It's a common mistake when first getting into the boat to have the oar lock facing to bow. However, you need to make sure that the oar lock points astern. If you point the oar lock to bow, you're going to have a funny pitch on your blade and your blades are going to dig 
really deep and it's going to be very uncomfortable to row. On top of that, the oarlock's not designed to, to resist the force that you put on the plastic end. There's a metal pin that needs to resist the force when the oarlock is facing astern. So again, to review, place the oarlock astern, get the narrow end of the shaft, place it in, push the oar all the way down so that the, that the collar rests in the oarlock and the button is pushed firmly against the oarlock. As we look at the collar, we can see that uh, we have a button and the, the button presses right up against the oar lock and you can adjust where the button lies on the collar. You can use a screwdriver. This one has a, uh, a Phillips or a cross shaped uh, screw in it and you just unscrew it and there's little notches that the, that the collar slides into so you move it, you can either move it close towards the handle or close towards the blade. If the, uh, the button is close to the handle, you're going to have a heavier load on the blade. If the button is closer to the, to the blade, you're going to have a lighter load when you, when you pull on your oar. This is, this is basically just changing your leverage point. What also will happen is, uh, as well as changing the amount of load you get, you'll also change the amount of crossover you experience in your hands. And uh, as you have as you move your, your collar closer to the, the blade, you'll have more crossover and it'll make your, your movements a bit more, more difficult because you'll have a chance of, of nicking your hands on your, on your knuckles. For uh, less experienced rowers, they might find uh, having, a, having the, the collar closer to having the, the button closer to the, the handle, they might find that a bit more freeing because they don't have to worry about their hands nicking each other. However, uh, more experienced rowers who are used to rowing in a rowing shell and used to the crossover, they, they may enjoy having their, their button um, closer to the blade. In fact, I have another oar here. And in fact, this is, this is how I, I normally set up my blade, just because uh, I like to have more speed of the blade through the water. Uh, in fact, it doesn't really affect the amount of calories that you burn where it is. Uh, I just find that the loading uh, feels better on my on my low back if I if I move the if I move the button uh, closer towards the blade. When holding the oar handle, you want to hold it like this. Make sure your thumb is placed over the tip of the end and you're exerting a firm, constant pressure into the oar lock. You also want to keep the oar handle in the pads of your hand and in your finger. When you're taking your stroke, you'll grip the oar like this. You don't want to grip the oar like this with your hand turned over or grip the oar like that with your wrist turned under. Too much gripping will cause repetitive stress in your forearm and can lead to tendonitis. When you draw the handle in, you want to make sure that the pressure exists in the hook of your fingers, almost like a meat hook. You also want to make sure that you have a straight line from your knuckles to your forearm. Draw the oar in Slightly drop your wrist when you feather and then quickly return the hand to that straight line. As you're going up the recover, you should be able to wiggle your fingers and feel the weight of the blade in your fingers. And your, the handle will move slightly from your fingers into the front of your palm as you square and get ready to take the next stroke. Here we have the foot stop. The foot stop takes the brunt of all the power that you put onto the boat. 
we strap in with Velcro straps. You can just wear your ordinary running shoes, which makes it really easy for getting in and out of the boat. You can also adjust the bottom of the foot plate. You can unscrew the screws and move it up or down. So if you have a smaller shoe, for example, you can move the plate up and be able to fit in. Here we have the sliding seat. It has a bit of a funny shape. We see two holes here for our sit bones and a cutout for our coccyx. You want to make sure that the flat part is always facing to the flat part of the boat, astern. The sliding seat comes off the tracks fairly easily. <clears throat> As you can see, there are little hooks here that hook into the tracks. The wheels have bearings built into them to protect from the salt water. Getting into a Whitehall boat, you want to keep your center of gravity as low as possible. You want to keep your butt as close to the dock and as close to the seat as possible. Before getting in, make sure the seat is moved all the way to the bow so that you'll, it will be in the right position when you put your feet in the boat. You want to get your weight in the middle of the boat or along the keel of the boat as quickly as possible. If you have short legs, you can step on the side of the boat and then move into the middle of the boat. But because I have longer legs, I'm going to step directly into the center of the boat. Entering a boat in this way minimizes your chance of capsizing. However, because you are in such a wide-hauled boat, it's very, very difficult to flip. After getting into the boat, you're going to need to adjust your foot stretchers. Mine are adjusted from the last time I was rowing, but if my legs were longer, I'd have to move the foot stretchers away from me. If my legs were shorter, I'd have to move the foot stretcher towards me. As you can see, we have wing nuts that make the, the job pretty easy, and there's only two of them. After adjusting the foot stops, <clears throat> I velcro in my feet. If this was the first time I was rowing, I'd give a rough estimation of where to put my feet and then check once I've pushed off the dock with where my handles touch my body. fine-tune your foot stretchers. Once you've gotten into the boat, pull your handles towards your chest. If you have lots of room between the ends of your handles and your chest, you may need to move your foot stretchers to the stern. That's away from you. If you don't have very much room between your handles and your chest, if you can't move your handles past your rib cage, you're going to need to move the foot stretchers to the bow or towards you. 
me, I need to move my foot stretchers to the stern. The rowing stroke is broken up into many different parts. We've got the catch, the drive, the finish, and the recovery. The catch is also called front stops, and that's right before and as you put the blade in the water. The drive is as you're moving the blade through the water, and the finish is when you're at back stops, or the back of the slide, right before you take the blade out of the water. The recovery is the part of the stroke where you tap the blades down, feather them, and bring them forward up to the catch to take one more stroke. There's three ways to turn a rowing boat. I'll start with the simplest. The simplest is just to pull harder with one of your oars. Here I'm pulling hard with my starboard oar and I'm turning to port. Pulling with my left hand and I'm turning to the right. To turn on a smaller radius, you can hold water with the oar on the side towards which you are turning. For example, I want to turn to port or to the right, so I'm going to hold with my port oar while I take strokes with my starboard oar or my left hand. To turn in your length or with the smallest radius, you can take a normal stroke with one oar and take a backing stroke with the other oar. As you can see, my port oar is over squared as I am pushing it, as I'm pushing the water. The best way I find to back a boat is to over square your blade, so have it face the opposite way it should while you're taking a normal stroke. You place the blades in the water and push away from you like you're doing a push up or a mini bench press. The boat can move comfortably in this direction, although it's not designed to. The best way I've found to stop a boat is to dig your blade in the water slightly over feathered. You dig the blade in like this and then straighten your arm. As soon as your arm is straightened you can gradually over square the blade so that the boat can make a complete stop. This works really well and the boat will stop within under a boat length. Now we're back out on the water and we can get into more of the intricate parts of the rowing stroke. I'm going to talk about what the hands do first because that's the most dexterous part. It's usually the hardest thing for people to get their, their minds wrapped around. Again, you want the thumbs on the ends of the handles giving constant pressure out to the oar locks. In North America, we carry 
the left hand over the right after we tap down. You can be with you can be a little bit quicker with your left hand around the finish and lag a bit behind with your right hand. After you've gone past the center of the stroke with your hands, your right hand will have to move a little bit quicker to catch up with the advantage that your left hand has. Because your left hand will be a little bit in front of your right hand. The biggest muscle group that you use while you're rowing is your legs. You should feel your legs as soon as you put your blades in the water. And you should feel a firm pressure on your foot stops until after you've taken your blades out of the water at the finish. When you get up to the catch, Make sure you're catching with your shoulders, not with your back. I'll often see people take the catch of the stroke like this. This is the wrong way to, to row. You wanna take the catch with your body angle held and feel a firm pressure on your legs and keep your blades driving straight through the water. turn a little bit. I need to turn to, to starboard. So what I'm doing is I'm pulling a little bit harder with my port oar. I'm almost just placing my left oar or my starboard oar in the water without putting any pressure on it. This allows me to get a new line that I can then follow. Right now it's a little bit windy out and the bow of my boat is gently being pushed to port. So I have to pull a little bit harder with my port oar to keep the boat going straight. After you pick up the catch with your legs holding your body angle firm, You then start to engage your back into the stroke. You finish up the power in the stroke with the arms. Topping them out smoothly at the finish. You want your power to increase accordingly as you add your back to your legs and your arms. Legs, back, arms. Legs, back, arms. Legs, back, arms. I like to make sure all three of my legs, backs, and arms are finishing together. Just make sure maximum power is placed at the finish, at the point in the stroke when the boat is traveling the fastest. A good drill for you to try 
to make sure that you're not using too much of your upper body and you're keeping your focus on your legs is to sit up tall and to cut out your back and your arms like so. After you've taken a few strokes with just your legs, add the second portion of the stroke, your back, like so. Your arms will break slightly, but that's okay. To finish it off, add in the arms, making sure your legs, back, and arms finish all together. The recovery is the next most important part of the stroke. If you recover poorly, not only will you make yourself more tired, you will also lose a lot of the valuable speed that you've worked so hard to put on the hull of the boat. The way I like to look at a good recovery starts with the slide. I like to take time on the slide when my hands are over my toes. I call that time over the toes. Again, we have to bring the focus back to the hands, which require a lot of dexterity. Need to move the hands quickly around the finish and set the body angle early. You want to feel a slight tug in your hamstrings before your knees break. This ensures that your body won't lunge at the catch and ensures that your blades won't sky too high into the air. When you're first learning how to row, Feathering and squaring the blades might feel extremely awkward. That's okay. There's a lot of your body parts moving at the exact same time. Square your blades. <clears throat> and the white hull will set up perfectly. The white hull creates an incredibly stable platform for this drill. In a racing hull, this drill would take years to practice. In a white hull, a child can master this in one afternoon. <clears throat> As we roll on the square, we will then find the perfect height to carry our blades and to carry our hands. Look out at your oar and make sure that it's only one inch above the water. When you then decide to feather, keep the blade at the same height. This will avoid skying the blade which then causes the blade to dig and allows you to lock on to a firm post for an excellent finish. For the beginner, it's easier to think about the rowing stroke in three separate pieces. Your legs, your back, and your arms. You pick up the water at the catch with your legs. You then add your back and then add your arms. Legs, back, arms. I'm saying their names when I engage them. Legs, back, arms. Legs, back, arms. <clears throat> On the recovery, you wanna come up the slide in the opposite way. 
First get your hands out past your knees, set your body forward, then come up the slide. Arms, back, legs. Legs, back, arms, arms, back, legs. It's important that you get your hands past your knees before they rise. Otherwise, the blades will ride on the water and sky into the air. Your blades will then dig deep and your stroke will not be nearly as efficient. You want to catch and keep your blades level like this. Almost pretend that there are leaves on the top of the water and you're brushing them along. Check where I'm going. The best way to look over my shoulder is to take a quick glance when my blades are still in the water at the end of the stroke. This ensures stability in a skinnier hull. However, in a white hull boat, I can look at any point in the stroke because it is so stable. I select a point behind me off the bow, tip of the bow of the boat. I then quickly look astern and find a point on the horizon that I can focus on. Once I focus on that point in the horizon, I keep the boat moving in a straight line away from it. Right now as I roll along, I'm looking at a little white boathouse. If you look up along the horizon, there's a tall skinny tree. If I pull harder with my port or my right oar, I move to starboard and my stern moves to the right. So I'll correct by pulling harder on my left oar or my starboard oar and realign to the point I've picked on the horizon. Every 10 or 20 strokes, I'll take a quick glance over one of my shoulders to make sure I'm still moving in the same direction. And then refocus on that point in the horizon that I had before, or readjust the point as I see fit. I, I'll look at trees, buildings, plants, rocks, whatever is available to look at. I brought with me my gold medal. It's pretty beautiful to look at and still gives me chills when I bring it out. In fact, this only came after 12 hard, long years of, of work in my sport. Having spent so much time in a racing shell, I found it a relief to hop into a into a recreational shell that I could do anything in. In fact, I could take this out in any weather, go in one and a half to two meter swells and load it up with crab traps and uh, 
and have a great time. I love exploring in it and seeing new places I, I couldn't otherwise go. I think that this boat is, is a great recreational shell uh, because of its stability. Uh, people can go out with relatively no or even no experience and have a great time and even find a way to get a, a good workout in. I recommend this boat to expert and novice alike.